A warm welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Katerina Zuru, and it is a big pleasure to welcome you all in this event of the uh, Echoing Project with uh, a rare uh, guest, Jill Cousins, director of uh, the Hand Museum. Hello, Jill. Very nice to be here. Jill, what is crowdfunding? Why are we here? What this matters for museums? Um, well, what, yeah, what is crowdfunding? I think, well, crowdfunding for me is where you have a project that you want to get funded and you're using um, the, the power of the crowd, normally via a crowdfunding platform um, and their money in order to raise funds for the project that uh, you want to make happen. And why is it important, crowdfunding for them, for a museum uh, team? Uh, I mean, come on, museums get money from uh, state funding and uh, entrance tickets. They do, um, but they don't get enough money, uh, or maybe more accurately, that money tends to go towards the covering of running costs, so your staff, your building, heating, lighting. Um, small promotions so if you want to do something new then you need to raise money and that's via grants or sponsorship or events or indeed uh, crowdfunding so it's a it's it's part of that mix um, of where are you going to get funds to do things that you would like to do uh, within the museum or the cultural heritage institution money 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 funds 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 is crowdfunding only for money too uh, no, I don't. I think actually, I, I think it's very much part of an overall uh, thing that you are doing, or how you making how you make the museum work relevant to your communities, relevant um, in today's world. So, um, it's part of a, a funding mix, as I said, but it, it has several other benefits, such as raising awareness um, of the museum and its activities. It's got reputational benefits. Um, because you're seen to be actively participating in in um, uh, a slightly broader field of, of going out instead of just constantly going with your hand out you're being very active well you're still going with your hand out but you're going you're you're being uh, very active about the mechanisms that you're using um, by using crowdfunding um, but it's also about I think community development um, volunteering, engagement in the project that you're trying to build. So um, the more that you're engaging people in uh, being part of the crowdfunding, the more invested they are in making the eventual project work. And you tend to need volunteers for that as well. I would like to share some slides about the project in which this event uh, takes place. Um, it is the Echoing project. It is about recovery of cultural heritage and innovative actions led by universities. It is a project funded by the Norwegian National Agency, and it is an Erasmus Plus KA2 action uh, in the triangle between um, universities, cultural heritage, technology, and society. Uh, together, this is our website. Have a look. Uh, before Jill's um, workshop today, uh, we organized a webinar with uh, Stephanie Economo and Ioan Sakharov about introduction to crowdfunding. And today's event is uh, the follow-up where Jill is going to tackle also the, the, the challenging issues around the design and implementation of a crowdfunding uh, campaign for cultural heritage. So um, what is the topic of the webinar today is how to set up a campaign the do's and don'ts for cultural heritage organizations that plan a campaign. What's the role of citizens to enhance the impact and social value of fundraising? And what happens beyond once uh, funds have been collected? How to sustain uh, citizen engagement? After Jill's talk and during summer, we also plan to organize a crowdfunding campaign. Katrina said, I've got a background, obviously, in running Europeana. But before that, I had quite a business and publishing oriented uh, background, uh, which 
and always in digital and the internet. So really um, almost since after my first career as a map researcher for the Ministry of Defence, I then went into digital databases and then was um, uh, at, the, at, the, at the beginning of the uh, internet in sort of 1993 onwards. Um, and I think that's given me, um, it's given me a very useful uh, understanding of how digital can work for you and how the internet can work for you, although I do not understand or, or use all the tools. Um, it also makes me uh, very much a, a Jill of all trades, a master of, or mistress of, of, of none. Um, so I'm hoping that what I'm going to talk to you about today um, chimes with what you want to know about uh, crowdfunding. Please ask any questions along the way. I'll try and check uh, the chat uh, along the way. So a little bit about the, um, the, the Hunt Museum. Um, it's a 18th century Georgian Platonate uh, building in the center of Limerick. It backs onto the Shannon. Um, there is a harbor at the bottom. It was a custom house. Um, so it is where people would log their goods. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful building. It's a nightmare to run anything as a, like a modern museum in because you can't do anything within uh, the structure. We get about 100,000 visitors a year um into the museum and well over 250,000 uh through the um museum itself it's got a very diverse collection we've actually got three collections um they range from neolithic uh to the 21st century so things like 2000 year old um egyptian Toth, the baboon, uh, through to the little maquette you see of the, the costume is from uh, Sybil Connolly. She's our third um, uh, collection uh, designer from the 1950s, Irish fashion designer from the 1950s, right the way up to the more contemporary, which is that rather nice round bowl uh, that you see, um, which is our Irish contemporary ceramics collection. Um, nearly everything, well, any, every, anything that can be is in the public domain, both in uh, digital and uh, non-digital uh, form, um, but we do respect copyright. So um, the ceramics, modern ceramics collections, they're all people who are very much alive and, uh, and kicking and they need to earn money from their, um, from their work. So... Um, I think one of the, the the key things to understand always is the the, the crowdfunding uh, motiv motivations. Um, so this um, uh, I think it's worth always saying that. Sorry, I'm trying to operate two screens, which is very dangerous. Let me tell you. Uh, here we go. Um, so prior to attempting the two campaigns that we uh, that I'm going to talk to you about, um, I had one other actual experience, which was under Europeana Creative, um, it was the Van Gogh Yourself. And we set that up with uh, Goteo, who are a crowdfunding platform, which I thoroughly recommend. And they've gone from strength to strength. And particularly if you're doing anything in the social uh, uh, area, um, sort of uh, society-based um, uh, things to do with environment, those kind of things. So they're they're very good at it. Um, and then the other one was the one that you see on screen here, which was Big Buck Bunny. Um, and this was the one that made me understand uh, that you could get people to give you uh, money for something that they were interested in. Um, so relatively small amounts. Uh, of money. So Big Buck Bunny was about creating, it was done by an animator, sort of software um, animator, um, and I think it was 2008, 2009, and they were trying to create a film, and what they wanted to be able to do was to make the, the, the fur on the bunny, whoops, um, make the fur on the bunny uh, move. 
Um, so they were able to go out to all the other people who would know, like to know how you make that kind of thing work, remembering that this is back in 2008. And they gave them first dibs on the software for whatever it was that they wanted to do. So it was a, it was a very interesting um, uh, understanding as far as I was concerned. Uh, I think it's probably true to say that um, crowdfunding varies between altruistic, altruism plus personal gain or um, some level of uh, professional uh, gain. So, and I'll come back to I'll come back to that in in a second. So we have two campaigns, uh, fund a couple and um, uh, stitch in time. The first was to turn a very blank space um, into a museum in the garden. The second was to raise funds to repair and conserve our third collection of haute couture by the island's 1950s designers. So will Connie um, actually dress people like uh, Jackie Kennedy Onassis and Julie uh, Christie. Um, the stages of a crowdfunding campaign or, or project are, I think, uh, these so and you'll see from the slides that there's a much more of an emphasis on the setup and how you set it up than there is on the the running it or even the the aftermath of it and what you do with the with the project um you do need that very clear goal and objective uh it needs to be crystal clear for the person who is um uh, funding you i think you also need a very clear uh, value proposition so who are you, um, uh, you want to raise funds for something, but why is that of importance to the people who are funding you? Uh, you do need to be able to choose the, the platform. There are several out there, um, some uh, geared much more towards social causes or not-for-profit. Um, you do need to know that that crowdfunding platform has got other similar projects, particularly if you're in the heritage area, so that then they have already got audiences that are engaged in that, uh, that area and therefore are more likely uh, to fund uh, you. Um, you need that uh, to know who your target audience is. Um, and interestingly, for the two that we did, one was much easier than the other. Um, but the results were reversed. So defining the target audience for Sybil Connolly was actually quite relatively easy. It's people who are interested in fashion history, fashion heritage, in fashion generally, um, uh, in conservation uh, of textiles, that kind of thing. It was actually quite, quite relatively easy to define um, who the audience was. Um, the one for Funder Cobble, because we were trying to build a museum in a garden, uh, was much more diverse, but had the benefit that you were going for high, higher uh, net worth funders, if you like. So we had a lot of local businesses interested in it. Um, we had a lot of people who wanted to do, uh, have kind of legacy around it. So it was a wider uh, audience that we were trying to, to get to. Um, and it could cover anything from gardening through to um, uh, wanting to actually fund a cobble for a legacy to to show that they had something there, that kind of thing. So it was it was very wide ranging, um, but we did actually target very specific audiences within it. I think you need a very strong, clean design um, because you're going to have to carry that all the way through the the campaign. Uh, uh, it, it isn't just about one video, as you'll know. It's it's about all that social media that you're going to be putting out there, the posters that you're putting up, and it's got to be recognisable each time with a call uh, to uh, funding, a call a call to the website where the the, the platform where the funding takes place. Um, you do need very clear rewards and reasons uh, to uh, support, and I'll come on to those in the in a minute. The marketing comms uh, campaign is um, in uh, very integral to it. Um, you have to build 
you have to not piss people off um, by constantly harassing them, but you do need them uh, to be engaged in it and to tell other people. I think one of the strongest areas in relation to marketing and comms, and I'll come back into this a bit later, is the ambassadors um, and your personal contacts, and they need to be on board from the, from the very beginning. Um, you need a social media campaign uh, and you need it to be ready before you start because you won't have time uh, when you're running the campaign um, to put a lot of it together, although you do need to, and I'll come back to that, adjust. Um, and you need to actually understand what your timeline is. So are you running a six week campaign, a two month campaign, a three month campaign? Uh, people get tired after a certain uh, uh, point in time. So you need you, you definitely need to decide uh, what your audience is going to take, how many of your audience you're going to be able to attract in and, and should it go on beyond six weeks to, to two months. You also need to make it very, very easy to give. Um, this was a problem for us with the platform that we chose, which was um, uh, Fundit. They didn't really cope with anything that wasn't in euros. Uh, which meant two of the markets which would have been good for us, which are the US market and the UK market, became very challenging uh, to get the money in uh, from. So I think that was a uh, an area that I, I, learned, um, uh, I, learned, I learned a lot from. Um, the second stage is the running. So this is your social media and comms campaign lots of content linked to uh, the objective or objectives, um, including endorsements from people who are, are, who are funding. Um, we found that having events was pretty useful um, because it refreshes uh, your campaign. So whether it was the Stitch and Bitch event for Sybil Connolly or painting cobbles um, for kids uh, for Funder Cobble. Um, you need to be able to show progress um, as you go along. Um, you need to be able to give updates to the funders, so encouraging them to tell a friend or five. And you need that constant monitoring. So you're looking to see what's happening. Um, is it working? What's working? Do I change the emphasis? Do I adjust because I've run out of some things and not others? And then the last stage is the follow up. And, and I don't think this should be underestimated in terms of the time it takes you uh, to do it. So there's uh, people want whatever it is that they purchase really uh, quickly. Um, so if, for instance, you're having uh, mugs made, you've got to get those uh, made or you're having cobbles made, you've got to get those made. And that depends on the craftsman. So you need to manage that. You do need a very big uh, thank you um, and that it's great you've achieved the target, that everybody feels that they've contributed to a success. Um, you need to then tell people how the project that has been crowdfunding is going. And I, and I think we did that very well. And it was very evident with uh, Thunder Cobble, which you'll see. Um, it's been harder to do with uh, Sybil Connolly because we've only raised so far half of the funds that we need to do in order to carry the project out. So that that's become um, a, a bit of an issue for us and, and something to, to take on board uh, going forward. And then, of course, the how do you you've got all these people who are really invested in your project how do you make sure that you're continuing to engage them um, in the project so i'm going to cover some of these parts of these um, in the campaigns but i do think that one of the real keys is knowing your value proposition so what are you providing to whom and who is helping you um, and I, th I think a version of the Osterwalder uh, business model helps clarify your thoughts. This is actually one that we have produced as part of the Recharge uh, project, which is new uh, participatory business models for museums. Um, and it's got a little bit more of an emphasis on participation um, uh, on uh, things like uh, social benefits. I see the things moved around slightly, um, and on environmental costs. So it is more geared towards uh, where cultural heritage institutions are at the moment. And I think 
one of the issues that you face in, uh, and it comes back to that altruism, um, why are people giving you the funds? So true altruism, it tends to be for health or crisis uh, related. So you're raising money to send a sick child uh, for treatment elsewhere or providing for refugees or feeding the world. Most cultural heritage uh, projects is not existential. It, it's a, it's going to be a mix of altruism, feeling good about giving your money to something you believe in, and probably some level of, of uh, personal gain uh, from it. It's about being very precise about what that value proposition is, um, and then being able to complete the normal parts of a, of a business model uh, canvas. Knowing um, who you will be working with and to whom you're appealing, I think is very fundamental. So for our first crowdfunder, the museum's motivation was to turn what was a very blank space into uh, a museum in a garden. It was a piece of grass cut in two where you might be able to see with some railings uh, down the middle, yet another barrier to entering into the museum. Uh, and it was used largely by dog, dog walk, or walkers and um, uh, people with relatively antisocial uh, tendencies. We had a lot of drug uh, misuse um, in, the, in the garden. This led us um, into this campaign. I'm going to play you this video and the one on uh, stitching time in full. At 200 euro, you can have your name inscribed on the side of the garden boxes that are for local community use. If you would like to further commemorate someone or an event, then for 500 euro, you can provide a garden bench. Every donation will be listed on the Hunt Museum website and on our social media. I know this might seem strange to ask in a very challenging times, but we think we should look towards the future into making a better environment and one that's not in a confined space. So we want to do it now to make people's lives a little better. You from gold toys, hunt museum in a garden, and making Limerick a more livable place. We are going to help. Can you? If so, please visit www.hotmuseum.com. So this gave you an idea of, well, it gave you what the rewards were um, and the goals uh, for, for Funder Cobble. It was uh, filmed during COVID, so it had to be largely done outside and anything done inside could only be done with kids uh, so they didn't have to wear masks. So that was a, another challenge that we, we faced at the time. At the time. The things that really appealed uh, to people were these cobbles themselves. So getting their names engraved uh, or the names of their loved one or somebody that they wanted to um, thank uh, during COVID. So that was very much uh, related to it. It was, it was um, important for them to do that. Um, and then the benches, which you see behind Old McMahon, who was one of the first of the 3D sculptures to go into the garden, and the naming of those benches, and they're designer benches, so the little glass plaques that you see on the back have got little quotes on them, or they're dedicated to, uh, to, to somebody, and they were very, very popular, and in fact we um, uh, ran out, which um, is probably not the best, uh, 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 well, we could probably have sold more of them. Um, the platform wasn't flexible enough for us to be able to add more in, which was something to bear in mind. Um, and the uh, other issue was to be able to get enough of them made and not just have a garden full of benches, which might have been where we uh, where, where we got to. Um, so it was successful. Uh, we raised. We had a target of fifteen thousand. We raised. 17,760. And I think the important figure here is actually the 224 funders. Um, that's good because those are the people who then uh, you can engage um, in your project uh, uh, moving forward. And that's been very much the, uh, the case uh, going forward. Um, the 
Um, next one, if I can get to it, is a stitch in time. We sort of made it for this one. Um, it had incredibly broad publicity, as, as you will see, and a lot of engagement, a lot of people passing on the information, telling everybody to support. And I think there were two things that we could have done differently. One, we needed a higher value reward. Um, the problem with a five euro thank you, which we were encouraged to do, is that you need an awful lot of five euros to get to your twelve and a half thousand. Um, and it's a bit of a cop out. So people say, oh, I've done it. I've done my bit. I'll do I'll do five euros. And we have we did have quite a lot of them. Um, and the um, uh, probably. Uh, I think the other main reason is that was the rewards were not, they were kind of extras. They were, okay, I get something for it. I've bought something. It wasn't that I was, that I'm leaving something behind or I'm really contributing to something uh, and it will always be there. So what, what happened with this one was that we actually ended up having to put some of the money of the Gertrude Hunt funds into this figure, because if we didn't, we would then not achieve the target. And as you will all know, if you don't achieve the target, then you don't receive any of the money uh, that goes into the, the crowdfunding. And that becomes quite um, a lot of pressure at some point. So I actually contributed um, a thousand, I, the museum contributed a thousand um, into this in order to get us over the line and, and over the line well, um, uh, which is, so it, it worked, um, but not as well as the, the first one did. And I think the reasons were very much around um, what do I get out of it? And it goes back to that value proposition.